Exploratory Committee on the Application for 1951. Hundreds of firemen have assisted the committee in conducting these tests. The firemen not only performed the firefighting operations, but also assisted in collecting and repairing the buildings. This is a representative group firemen and committee members who worked on one series of tests involving four fires. Test fires have been fought in several types of buildings, including this fire-resistive training building and this six-room duplex frame dwelling in Miami, Florida. The next tests involve typical dwelling buildings in Kansas City, Missouri, a one-story stuccoed frame house, this one-story concrete block residence, and the adjoining house, which was a two-story frame dwelling covered with composition siding. the city, this six-family, three-story brick flat was made available. Then in Memphis, this and two other frame dwellings were used for test fires. The six test series had this well-seasoned two-story farmhouse for its subject at Ponca City, Oklahoma. The next tests were at Ames, Iowa, in this large two-story frame structure. In several tests, occupied buildings were as close as 10 feet to the test buildings and were protected by water curtains, as at the last test in 19... Buildings were loaded with fuel, considered similar in combustibility to that found in the average dwelling. In many cases, actual furniture was arranged in the rooms and scrap lumber added to complete the fuel load. In all tests, thermocouples were installed in the building and groups such as this recorded temperature conditions from the time the fire was ignited. Different nozzles were used. Here is a typical booster line discharge pattern. Nozzle pressure is being adjusted on a one and one and a half inch nozzle. This is the applicator pattern. These test nozzles were those actually being used by the local fire department. This master stream helps apply water fog in excess of the heat being produced. This ladder pipe pattern delivers large volumes of fog enabling above ground sweeps or application. And guesswork is out. This shows measuring the angle of discharge prior to tests. Fire in the training building was allowed to burn until the ceiling temperature in the fire area reached 1,200 degrees. Doors and windows were closed when temperatures were above 800, so that at the, at the time attack was made, conditions within the building represented a confined fire. Black smoke and burning gases indicate some limitation of the air for combustion, even before closing up the building. Fire was attacked with one spray nozzle at 100 pounds pre nozzle pressure directed through a window towards the ceiling and rotated to give widest distribution to the water particles. The temperature was reduced to approximately 200 degrees in four minutes. The smoke in the building was displaced by steam and temperature was reduced sufficiently to enter the building and extinguish remaining small deep-seated fires. Results thus obtained by indirect application of water, justified further study and tests. Fire was set in the first floor of this building, but soon spread to the second floor up an open stairway. Two one-inch booster lines, each with 100 pounds nozzle pressure, will be used, one at the back and one at the front door. Temperature reached 1,350 degrees just before attack. 112 gallons of water were applied indirectly, reducing temperature to 150 degrees. Flames ignited eaves above rear windows, and this burning was also extinguished, although no water was directed at this spot. Overhauling required 145 gallons of water. 
this fire was completely extinguished in five minutes, eight seconds, using 257 gallons of water, less than the capacity of many booster tanks. Sometimes the indirect attack completed extinguishment, a sort of a bonus. This fire involved the entire attic. You will see the entire operation. Starting at 900 degrees, a 42 second indirect application of water from a booster line with 100 pounds nozzle pressure reduced the attic temperature to 280 degrees using only 16 and two thirds gallon of water and the fire was O-U-T out. Even the fireman at the nozzle found it hard to bleed. We also learned from mistakes. This fire involved one apartment in this building. Temperature had reached 940 degrees when it was attacked with a three quarter inch booster line at 100 pounds nozzle pressure for two minutes and 35 seconds. 73 gallons of water were applied to reduce the temperature to 270 degrees, but an additional seven minutes, 32 seconds using 10 gallons of water were required for overhauling. This seemed excessive, and upon investigation, it was found that the nozzle had been carried inside, and the spray had been striking a partition only a short distance in front of the nozzle. Water which hit the partition could not readily be converted into steam, since it was no longer in finely divided form. The dark smoke, which can occasionally be seen, indicates incomplete extinguishment. The committee decided to try again, duplicating this fire as closely as possible at the other end of the building in an identical apartment, using reduced nozzle pressure and keeping the nozzle at the door. On this test, the temperature reached 1,070 degrees. First application was made in the front door, the same three quarter inch booster line at 50 pounds pressure, discharged only 16 gallons per minute. After 45 seconds, the nozzle was moved to the rear windows and indirect application continued for another minute and 10 seconds. 30 gallons of water reduced the temperature to 160 degrees. Only 18 gallons were required for the overhaul, making a total of 48 gallons used, well below the capacity of any booster tank. Comparison with the previous test indicates clearly the importance of selecting a fog pattern and nozzle pressure, which will not impinge upon walls or ceiling of the fire area if most efficient results are to be expected. The first attempt at indirect application from more than one position appeared to be advantageous, and later tests confirmed this impression. Another typical dwelling test fire using a booster spray line for extinguishment. Fire in the eaves to your left was quickly subdued within the first few seconds of application. Due to the intense heat, the water was quickly converted to steam and carried to every nook and crevice in the building, a much faster accomplishment than possible with a solid stream. The large mass of condensing steam being forced from all openings, including the eaves and attic vent, proves conclusively that water was being used wisely. This fire was set on the first floor and extended to the attic. The dense smoke pouring from the vent in the peak indicates lack of oxygen for complete combustion. It bursts into flame outside the building as soon as the temperature is high enough. Although the entire building was involved, the heat was removed by application at the second window from the front, barely visible in the deep shadow. One one and one half inch line with 60 pounds nozzle pressure was used. The original plan for attacking this fire called for the use of another one and one half inch line at the rear of the building. However, 20 seconds of application using 20 gallons of water completely controlled the fire and the second nozzle was never used. In accordance with our agreement, this building is being removed by burning. Large stream seen in the background is actually playing on adjacent exposures and not the fire. People are living in the building only 16 feet from this fire. 
However, the test building being completely involved, another test was in order. Intermittent large-scale application from different ground-level vantage points. Leaping flames from the windows are endangering the fire truck. But wait, here comes the fireman with a two and one half inch spray nozzle. A few seconds here and the truck is safe. Hurriedly, the line is moved to three other windows and all visible flames are gone from the lower floors. The condensed steam seen coming from the first two floors proves that four short bursts fired into the windows using a total of approximately 75 gallons of water delivered a knockout blow to fire in these areas. The solid stream in the foreground is being used to keep the wooden porches from burning and falling onto the fire equipment and is not a part of the test. Here is another instance where the attack was incorrectly planned. We have a building where fire is free burning on the outside. Fire also completely involves the attic and a small amount of fire is in one second floor room. Maximum effect with water spray application requires that the water be introduced into an area containing sufficient heat to convert the water to steam. Originally, it was thought that spray application would be effective only where there was some degree of confinement. And up to this point, all the tests had been attacked by directing water into the room where ignition originated. So in this test, water was applied through the window into the second floor room. It will be observed that negligible amounts of steam are being generated, and therefore the application at this point should have been stopped. The fire continues unhampered even though water is being applied into the room at rear of the picture. Now, note that steam is being generated, indicating effective application. This application was by use of spray stream on the unconfined fire on the exterior of the building, thus indicating that the fire does not need to be confined for this method to be effective. On this test, the plan of attacking the fire for only short periods of time through each of several openings was again tried. The picture will show a continuous scene of the attack using one one and one half inch nozzle at 60 pounds pressure. Note that each application is approximately of five seconds duration, first at the front, then at a side window, and finally at the rear of the building. The temperature was reduced from 1400 degrees to 190 degrees in only 20 seconds. The total amount of water applied before entering the building was only 20 gallons. After 20 seconds indirect application, the fireman entered the building, and 30 seconds later, the fire was completely out, using a total of only 50 gallons of water. In this test, the firemen were equipped with self-contained masks. This is a practice to be highly recommended when men are required to enter rooms where fire is in progress. A study of the data obtained during the various tests indicates a definite pattern of temperature change can be expected when a fire starts in a building. The temperature rises at a rate depending on the type of fuel and quantity of air. In some cases, this rise is surprisingly slow, and in other cases, the increase is very rapid. In most fires, the temperature builds up to a maximum and levels off somewhere above 1,000 degrees. Apparently, this maximum temperature will be maintained with some fluctuation until the fuel is consumed or the air supply changed or the attack is made. In the tests, when water is spray form was properly applied, the interior temperature was very rapidly reduced to less than 200 degrees. The rate of drop seems to depend on the rate of water application, which must be sufficient to absorb heat faster than it is being generated by the fire. In most of the tests, the extreme temperature drop occurred within 30 seconds to one minute, after which time firemen encountered no difficulty in entering the building. Maximum effect of this method 
requires that there must be sufficient heat present to convert the water to steam, and as soon as steam generation has ceased, further application at that point will be ineffective. Will the theory work? This is not an official test, but a demonstration of how the Miami, Florida Fire Department handles fires of this type. This six-room frame duplex has been loaded with old furniture and scrap lumber to simulate actual conditions and then fired. And it looks as if someone should call the fire department. The picture shows that the entire interior of the building, including contents, is involved, and the fire has advanced to the attic. No temperature readings were taken, as this is strictly a demonstration. Application of water spray is primarily through two one and one half inch nozzles, the third line being used outside to cover exposures and extinguish exterior fires. White puffs of condensing steam show rapid fire control. This fast cooling below 212 degrees permits rapid advancement of hose lines. Complete extinguishment was accomplished with 420 gallons of water in three minutes and five seconds. This is using water wisely. Firefighting methods verified and developed during these tests have been very effective on the types of fires tested. These have been in dwellings with some degree of confinement. When a fire reaches a stage, such as you see here, it is no longer confined and is generating so much heat that it cannot be approached within effective range of hand lines. Convection currents carry flying brands from the fire, endangering buildings over a large area. Radiated heat may ignite buildings at considerable distances. This committee has not as yet been able to make a satisfactory investigation of this problem, but it has observed considerable evidence that large spray streams directed into the hot updraft immediately above the fire, as you see here, will reduce the rate of heat generation sufficiently to permit firemen to approach and extinguish the fire. Here again, a spray nozzle operating from an aerial ladder and discharging about 750 gallons per minute materially reduced the intensity of a very large fire completely involving a three-story flat. It was necessary to remove many of the buildings immediately after tests. The most practical way seemed to be by burning. Therefore, at the conclusion of tests, the structures were reignited. The final fire was not considered a test since no temperature readings were obtained and no effort was made to completely extinguish the fires. This is a scene of the largest of these fires. In the picture can be seen a stream from a large spray nozzle operated from an aerial ladder to cool the sparks and flying embers, thus reducing the conflagration hazard. This is one application where it is felt that further investigation will prove of value. The radiated heat from this fire was so intense that close approach with hand lines was not practical. When the spray stream from the ladder pipe was directed over the fire, the heat was materially reduced so much that observers were able to approach closely on that side. Almost complete blackout was obtained at points reached by the water spray. It seems probable that had another large nozzle on a ladder pipe or on a deluge set been employed on the near side of the fire in this scene, complete control would have been rapidly accomplished. The committee hopes to obtain facilities which will permit future tests with large building fires, large open fires, such as are encountered in lumber yards, and with groups of buildings which will approach conflagration problems. This report is respectfully submitted by Emma T. Cox, Fire Prevention Department, Western Actuar Actuarial Bureau, Chairman. R.J. Douglas, Fire Protection Department, Oklahoma A&M, Vice Chairman. John J. Ahern, Fire Protection Engineering Department, Illinois Institute of Technology, Secretary. Test buildings furnished by local fire departments. Technical assistance by committee personnel. Financial assistance by Arkansas Inspection and Rating Bureau, Kansas Inspection Bureau, 
Missouri Inspection Bureau, Oklahoma Inspection Bureau, Western Actuarial Bureau, Carl N. Clanton, Engineering Department, Kansas Inspection Bureau, Director of Photography. And oh, this you? is George Gow from radio station KNS in Wichita, Kansas, your narrator, who reminds you to check your house against fire before you go to bed. <laughs>